ladies and gentlemen, I'm sitting beside a guy who is possibly the, be <laughs> the best rock and roll drummer on earth. Would you agree with that? No, not really. I'm sure you would agree with that, John. Not at all. No, he, he doesn't agree with that at all. And uh, I'm going to ask him a most important question here. John, we've been watching that bit film there, and you do some really exo It must have taken you years to learn to play like that, did it? Not really. Yeah. <laughs> the weather's turned out nice again, Johnny. So, so. Yeah. Now, John drives some pretty exotic cars and motorbikes and plays a fair game of snooker, as you've no doubt seen from that clip of film. How long did it take you to learn to do that, John? A few months. Yeah. <laughs> Gee, the nights are drawing in now, eh? Yeah, uh, by the way, in the film there, I notice your son's a pretty heavy drummer. Jason, isn't it? Yes. Uh, do, are you envious? Yes. <laughs> Is it better than you? Could be. <laughs> On that cheery note, ladies and gentlemen.
sure that you do not disdain the idea of a, a hit single, all right? Uh, because you're the only major band that comes to my mind anyway who seemingly need not uh, have a hit single in order for the album to almost immediately go platinum. But uh, don't you find this a, to be a rather unique phenomenon today? Because most bands and most individual artists have to have a single to kind of... Yeah, but that's, the, the, mecha that's the mechanics of the, of the business. And it's one thing that... Although Peter guides us in his sort of unique way very, very well, and that's one thing that's unspoken, really, that, like, I mean, if you have to go to such a degree, there are certain channels that you take to try and, and promote an album, which are natural anyway. But, I mean, to take a cut off it so that people listen to the cut and then go and buy the album is not particularly at this time in in our lives the way that we want to do things so that you put a single out to sell an album that's, that's kind of the wrong way the album will sell if it's good and it'll sell to a degree if it's not good you know mm -hmm. but there's no point in taking the best track or something like that and sticking it out and fishing you know yeah. Or making an album last and last and last yeah. by c putting out cuts, you know. I don't, I don't really think. So another thing, there are one or two little principles that we've got. Mind you, on the new album, there are a couple of things that would stand nicely as singles, mm -hmm. as little show pieces. And there's a few things in the can that haven't come out that are also rather uh, novel. You know what we do too? Um, there's two things on, on the same subject. Uh, I haven't heard the album, like I said, and I'm sure by the time this, this interview is, is heard, you know, the album will, will be, have been heard by me and by everyone else. But at any yeah, rate, you're going to be in for a little, well, a wee bit of a surprise. But last night in, in the stage show, I, you know, the two, there were two tracks mm -hmm. from the new album that you played, and, the, and uh, in the evening struck me as I said, you know, if the Zeppelin, obviously knowing you for 10 years, I know that's not the way you approach things, but I said, you know, if they were to do that, I said, this has obviously got all the hooks, everything that you need for a yeah. single, you know, it, it's really there. Yeah, but it's too long. No, no, no. I what's, mean, I thought a single long? had to be uh, three minutes at the most. No, not anymore, and that's oh, really? not true. Oh, hey, I have not got something to do with the record <laughs> company, yeah, and I should, <laughs> I'll leave the singles to Dave Edmonds, because he's really good at them, you know, yeah. and... Uh, but as an album goes, there are several tracks, well, they're quite uh, diverse mm -hmm. in their very foundation, really. You see, when I, I had no intention of playing again at all, or even being a part of anything again particularly. And so when the time came that, it, that I was faced with uh, either saying goodbye to my fellows and, uh, and doing something totally new, not particularly musically or mm -hmm. or whatever and we had um, we got together I said yeah well if I'm going to do anything at all it obviously has to be uh, it's just got to keep changing it always has changed to a degree but I just wanted it to like, be a little more mellow or to, to explore facets that normally we would have thrown out as being a wee bit too soft aspects mm -hmm. of us that uh, weren't probably what people quite expected and I think really that is going to be in the next few years our, our ability to stay around you mm -hmm. know the fact that we're now prepared to explore even farther and this album really is just the, the kind of foot in the door yes. for the next few years to come. in 
welcome to episode eight of my Led Zeppelin album deep dives. I believe this is going to be my final episode in the series. I don't really consider Coda to be a studio album. It's got a couple of live tracks on there where the audience noise was wiped out. And then you just got some alternate takes and some stuff that were leftovers from other albums. So I'm not sure I'm going to do a deep dive on that record. So this is probably going to be my last Led Zeppelin episode. And I'm going to be talking about in through the outdoor this was released on august 15th 1979 they recorded it at a studio in stockholm and the major creative force on this album was john paul jones and to a lesser extent robert plant jimmy page and john bonham jimmy page was struggling with heroin addiction and john bonham was struggling with alcoholism which made each of them unreliable to varying degrees Often, John Paul Jones and Robert Plant would record their parts during the day, and John Bonham and Jimmy Page would stumble into the studio at night and do their parts. So not the most ideal recording uh, circumstances, but nonetheless, I still find this to be a pretty solid Led Zeppelin album. It's not my least favorite. It's not in my top five. It would be somewhere in my bottom five, let's put it that way. The cover was designed by Hypnosis. Of course, it's in a paper bag, and then you take the sleeve out. This cover is one where if you splash water on it, apparently it changes color, uh, which I think it was a pretty innovative design for 1979, but I think it's a cool concept. Of course, there were, I think, possibly eight different cover variations of this one. I only have this one. This is a repress, which I believe all the covers were, unless I'm mistaken, pretty standard. But anyway, one of those, I would love to get all the different cover variations at some point. But as of right now, I just have the one. As a final album, I mean, it's no Abbey Road, but I think it is a respectable record. I do. And it's a lot like... 1984 Van Halen where there's a lot of synthesizer stuff on here which I don't mind I'm a synth pop fan so it doesn't bug me as much I know there are people who hate this album because it does have a lot of synthesizers a lot of keyboards on it which reflects John Paul Jones influence but I'm a I'm a fan of this album I really am I like it more than presence believe it or not I've always just kind of had a soft spot for the album. So anyway, let's get into the songs on the album. It starts off, of course, with In the Evening, which is classic, classic Led Zeppelin. You've got that mysterious drone, that exotic drone at the beginning of the song, and then it kicks into very familiar Led Zeppelin territory. It's got a great guitar riff, some great guitar work by Jimmy Page.
it's an updated Led Zeppelin sound. La the last Led Zeppelin album had been put out three years before, so Led Zeppelin in that time had evolved their sound, and that's what you have with In the Evening, but a great, great album opener. The second track is Southbound Soares. I think that's how you pronounce it. I love the rhythm to this song. Again, it's all Robert Plant and John Paul Jones on this song, but it's a fun tune. I like the frenetic pace of it. Uh, I think Jimmy Page turns in a great guitar solo. Uh, I do like that one. is one of the biggest hits. I don't know if I'd call it a hit necessarily, but it's one of the most familiar tracks. It got the most radio play, at least in my part of town, uh, from this album. And I like the song a lot. It's very much a playful track. If there were going to be a hit single or any single released off this album, I got to believe it would have been either Fool in the Rain or All My Love. But Fool in the Rain is a fun song.
reminds me a little bit of Jermaker, uh, where they're playing around with some different time signatures, some different rhythms on this song. But I do like it a lot. The last song on side one is Hot Dog. I tend to skip over this song. It's a bit of rockabilly, a little more twang than they used on their previous rockabilly excursions. Just so-so. This song doesn't do a whole lot for me. I know people who love this song. I know people who hate it. I'm kind of in the, the latter camp. I'm just not crazy about the song. Side 2 opens up with Cara Salambra, and this is a full-on John Paul Jones keyboard extravaganza. And I do like all the synthesizers that you have on side two. And it had to have been a shock for a lot of people to hear all these synthesizers on a Led Zeppelin album. But it was 1979, for crying out loud. So you had Pink Floyd. You had bands like Rush who were starting to incorporate synthesizers into their music. So it wasn't altogether new ground that Led Zeppelin was breaking. But Kira Salambra, much like my complaint with Achilles last day and it just goes on too long does it need to keep going on and on I mean this really should have been a four or five minute song it does not need to be this long I mean it goes to some interesting places but it's certainly they could have taken the short way I don't know that this song needs to be that bloated but you may disagree, but that's just my feeling on Kara Salambra. Maybe they were out of material, but, I, you know, like if they could have made this shorter, they could have easily fitted Wearing and Tearing or one of the other tracks that got left off that were recorded during this session. <laughs> Next song is the tender, bittersweet, all my love. A very nice vocal from Robert Plant. Nice keyboards from John Paul Jones. Another forward thinking Led Zeppelin song. Kind of foreshadowed a lot of the music that we would get in the early 80s. It's one of my favorite Led Zeppelin ballads. I like this one a lot. And I almost read it as like a love letter from Robert Plant to his wife after the death of their son. So it has that quality to it, and I've always been a big fan of this one. And then their last song from their last album, I'm Gonna Crawl. I like this one. It's certainly not their best blues song, not the best blues song they ever did. There's a lot of synthesizer on here, but Jimmy Page turns in one of his most emotional, heartfelt guitar solos, most mournful guitar solos on this song, which I just love. And it's taken at a very slow, deliberate pace. But I'm a huge fan of I'm Gonna Crawl. I like this one a lot. And I'm a big fan of this album, even though, like I say, it's still in my bottom five. So anyway, let me know what you think of this album. Is it a favorite? Is it near your bottom? Let me know. Hope you've enjoyed this series and take care of yourselves.